Okay, so we are on page 1007, the challenge. So just to sum up real quick, Odysseus has made it home. He went to his, um, he went to his swine herd's hut. A swine herd is someone who takes care of the piggies, right? Mm -hmm. And he was dressed as a beggar, and he um, was sitting there, and Telemachus arrives, and they go off into a quieter area, and um, Odysseus is changed in his appearance from being a beggar. Oh, sorry. He's changed in his appearance from being a beggar to uh, being Odysseus, but Odysseus of 20 years ago, like hot Odysseus, like good-looking, clean-shaven, you know, rippling muscles Odysseus, that kind of Odysseus. And Telemachus is like, you must be a god! And he says, you are princely, and why are you crying so much? I am your father! And um, anyway, so only Telemachus knows that dad's back. Nobody else knows. Even the swine herd doesn't know. So they, uh, he says to his son, this is the plan. Uh, probably we should find out how many guys we're fighting, so count them up. And then, you know how we got all those nice weapons decorating the dining hall? Yeah, why don't you take all those swords and stuff down and put them in a back room so that um, the suitors don't have any weapons. And then he says, I'm going to find out who's good and who's bad. And uh, I'm going to be going there in disguise like a beggar. And if they're cruel to a beggar, it, you can tell a good person from a bad person. If a, if a, a person who's a bad person is... Um, cruel to people who are weaker than them. So anyway, they say, okay, that's the plan. And then we'll figure out how to kill them all, if they're bad. So then the um, Odysseus gets there as the beggar, and he goes into his own home in his own dining hall, and he wants to uh, have a piece of bread from someone. And Antinous, who is the jerkiest jerk you've ever met, he says, ew, you stink bad. And then he says, don't give him bread. And he says, obviously, people don't care about giving you bread when it's not their bread to give. This is Odysseus's bread that you're giving to this beggar who doesn't deserve it. And, of course, that's ironic because how can you throw away bread on Odysseus? Or how can you throw away Odysseus's bread when it's Odysseus to whom you're giving the bread? So, anyway, Antinous is a jerk. He throws a chair at Odysseus. Um, but it, the uh, narrator says, but there was obviously no damage to his Chuck Norris body, no damage at all. And um, then they realize, yep, we're going to be killing everybody. And so that's where we are. And now we're to something called the challenge. Page 1007, the challenge. Pressed by the suitors to choose a husband from among them, Penelope finally says that she'll marry the man who can string Odysseus's bow and shoot an arrow through 12 axe handle sockets. The suitors all try and fail. Still in disguise, Odysseus asks for a turn and gets it. When they say that they all try and fail, what they're saying is they couldn't even get the string on the bow. You know how in order for a bow to be effective, the string has to be really taut so that when you pull it back, it's got all that potential energy and it goes Pew! like that, right? Um, they can't even get the twine to go from the top of the bow to the bottom. They're like, mm, they can't even do that. So then this old man, Odysseus, comes up. Of course, look at the painting of him on page 1006. Uh, he is like Mr. Clean, bad, bad A. It's pretty cool. Okay. So now Odysseus goes and he picks up this bow, and he's famous for this party trick. He used to do this when he lived in the palace all the time. His base, basic party trick was he'd string his bow, and then he'd shoot the arrow through 12 axe handles into the bullseye at the end to, sh to show off what a great marksman he was and how strong he was that he could string this bow. 1,359. And Odysseus took his time, turning the bow, tapping it every inch for borings that termites might have made while the master of the weapon was abroad. The suitors were now watching him, and some jested among themselves. Oh, a bow lover, dealer in old bows. Maybe he has one like it at home, or he has an itch to make one for himself. See how he handles it, the sly old buzzard. They're all English, of course. And one disdainful suitor added this. May his fortune grow an inch for every inch he bends it. But the man skilled and always contending, satisfied by the great bow's look and heft, like a musician, a 
like a harper, when with quiet hand upon his instrument, he draws between his thumb and forefinger a sweet string note upon the peg. So effortlessly, Odysseus in one motion strung the bow. And then he slid his right hand down the cord and he plucked it, so that the top got vibrating, hummed and sang a swallow's note. So he strings it, and then he goes, Come here. <laughs> this kid is the bane of my existence. Look at all the other classes and repent. Oh, <laughs> you restarted? That was going to be a hit. In the hushed hall, it smote the suitors, and all their faces changed. And then, Ozis and then Zeus thundered overhead, one loud crack for a sign. And Odysseus laughed within him that the son of the crooked-minded Cronus had flung that omen down. He picked one ready arrow from his table, where it lay bare. The rest were waiting still in the quiver for the young men's turn to come. And he knocked it, and he let it rest across the hand grip, and he drew the string and grooved butt of the arrow, Amy from where he sat upon the stool. Twing! Now flash the arrow from training bow, clean as a whistle through every socket ring, grazed not one note to thud with heavy brazen head beyond. Boom! Then quietly Odysseus said, Telemachus, the stranger you welcomed in your hall has not disgraced you. I did not miss, neither did I take all day stringing the bull. My hand and I are sound, not so contemptible as the young men say. This is my favorite line. The hour has come to cook their lordship's mutton. Supper by daylight, other amusements later, with song and harping that adorn a feast. He dropped his eyes and he nodded, and the prince Telemachus, true son of King Odysseus, belted his sword on, clapped hand to spear, and with clink and glitter of keen bronze, stood by his chair in the forefront near his father. When he says the time has come to cook their lordship's mutton, what does that mean in modern English? What have you heard that sounds like that? Kick your ass. That's what it means, baby. The time has come to kick some ass. That's Whoa. what he's saying. <laughs> Odysseus's revenge. Okay, so they've done the contest. So obviously this beggar man, whoever he is, um, has the right to marry Penelope if he wants to, but obviously he's already married to her. And he has shown everybody that he's the one who's strong enough to string the bow, and he's shown everyone that he is to be... Um, <laughs> like, once he does that, everyone says to themselves, huh, none of us could do that bow trick. And the only person who's ever done that bow trick in the past is Odysseus. Hmm. And um, by the way, so there's, there are no weapons on the wall. And basically, Zeus has shown that he is in Odysseus's corner. How did, it, how did Zeus show that he was in Odysseus's corner? <laughs> and Odysseus went, eh, 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 eh. And then all the doors were shut, and now it's time to slaughter. Okay? Okay, page 1009, Odysseus's revenge. This is rated R. Now shrugging off his rags, the wiliest fighter of the islands leaped and stood on the broad do door still, his own bow in his own hand. He poured out her, at his feet a rain of arrows from the quiver, and he spoke to the crowd. <laughs> so much for that. Your clean-cut game is over. Now watch me hit a target that no man has hit before, if I can make this shot. Help me, Apollo. So he says a little prayer there. He drew to his fist the cruel head of an arrow for Antinous, just as the young man leaned to lift his beautiful drinking cup, embossed two-handed golden. The cup was in his fingers, the wine was even at his lips, and did he dream of death? How could he? In that revelry amid his throng of friends, who would imagine that a single foe, though a strong foe indeed, could dare to bring death's pain on him and darkness on his eyes? Twing! Odysseus's arrow hit him under the chin and punched up to the feathers through his throat. Backward and down he went, letting the wine cup fall from his shocked hand. Like pipes, his nostrils jetted crimson runnels, a river of mortal red, and one last kick upset his table, uh, knocking the bread and the meat to soak in dusty blood. 
Now as they craned to see their champion, where he lay, the suitors jostled in uproar down the hall, everyone on his feet. Wildly, they turned and scanned the walls in the long rooms for arms, but not a shield. Not a good ashen spear, spear was there for a man to take and throw. All they could do was yell in outrage at Odysseus. Ah, oh, foul! To shoot at a man! That was your last shot! Your own throat will be slit for this. Our finest lad is down. You killed the best on Ithaca. Buzzards will tear your eyes out. For they imagined, as they wished, that it was a wild shot, an unintended killing. Fools not to comprehend they were already in the grip of death. But glaring under his brows, Odysseus answered, You yellow dogs, you thought I'd never make it home from the land of Troy. You took my house to plunder. You dared to bid for my wife while I was still alive? Contempt was all you had for the gods who rule wide heaven. Contempt for what men say of you hereafter. Your last hour has come. You die in blood. As they took, as they all took this in, sickly green fear pulled at their entrails, and their eyes flickered, looking for some hatch or hideaway from death. Eurymachus alone could speak, and he said, Oh, if you are Odysseus of Ithaca, come back. All you say these men have done is true. Rash actions, many here, more in the countryside. But, but here he lies, the man who calls them all. Antinous was the ringleader. He whipped us on to do these things. He cared less for a marriage as than for the power of Cronion has denied him as king of Ithaca. For that, he tried to trap your son and would have killed him. He's dead now and has his portion. Ha ha. Spare your own people. As for ourselves, we'll make restitution of wine and meat consumed and add each one a tithe of 20 oxen with gifts of bronze and gold to warm your heart. Meanwhile, mm, we cannot blame you for your anger. Odysseus glowered under his black brows and said, Not for the whole treasure of your fathers, all you enjoy, lands, flocks, or any gold put up by others, would I hold my hand. There will be killing till the score is paid. You forced yourselves upon this house. Fight your way out, or run for it if you think you can escape death. I doubt one man of you skins by. They felt their knees and their hearts, they felt their knees fail and their hearts, but they heard Eurymachus for one last time rallying them. Friends, he said, the man is implacable. Now that he's got his hands on bow and quiver, he'll shoot from the big doorstone there until he kills us to the last man. Fight, I say. Let's remember the joy of it. Swords out. Hold up your tables to deflect the arrows. After me, everyone. Rush him where he stands. If you can budge him from the door, if we can pass into the town, we'll call out to men to chase him, and this fellow with the bow will shoot no more. He drew his sword as he spoke. A broadsword of fine bronze, honed like a razor on either edge. The crying, then crying hoarse and loud. That's what he does. He hurled himself at Odysseus. But the kingly man let fly an arrow in an instant. And the quivering feathered butt sprang to the nipple of his breast. And the barb stuck in his liver. Yeah. The bright broadsword clanged down. He lurched and fell aside, pitching across the table. His cup, his bread and meat were spilt and scattered far and wide, and his head slammed on the ground. Revulsion, anguish in his heart, with both feet kicking out, he downed his chair while the shrouding wave of mist closed on his eyes. Amphinomus now came running at Odysseus, broadsword naked in his hand. He thought to make the great soldier give way at the door. But with a spear thrown from behind, <laughs> Telemachus hit him between the shoulders as, he lent, as the lance had drove clear through his chest. And he left his feet and fell forward, thudding, forehead against the ground. Telemachus swerved around him, leaving the long, dark spear planted in Amphinomus. If he paused to yank it out, someone might jump him from behind and cut him down with a sword at the moment he bent over. So he ran, ran from tables uh, to his father's side and halted, panting, saying, Father, let me bring you a shield and spear, a pair of spears, a helmet. I can arm on the run uh, myself. I'll give outfits to Eumaeus and his cowherd. Better to have equipment, said Odysseus. Run then, while I hold them off with arrows, as long as the arrows last. When all are gone, if I'm alone, they can dislodge me. 
Quick upon his father's word, Telemachus ran to the room where spears and armor lay. He caught up four light shields, four pairs of spears, four helms of war high plumed with flowing manes, and he ran back, loaded down to his father's side. He was the first to pull a helmet on and slit his bare arm into a buckler strap. The servants armed themselves, and all three took their stand beside the master of battle. So there's four guys. Four guys fighting an entire room of hundreds of men. However, those hundreds of men have no weapons. All they have is brute strength. While he had arrows, he aimed and shot, and every shot brought down one of his huddling enemies. But when all barbs had flown from the bowman's fist, he leaned his bow in the bright entryway uh, beside the door and armed a four-ply shield hard on his shoulder and crested helm, horse-tailed, nodding stormy upon his head, that's a lot of detail for a hat. Uh, then he took his tough and bronze shod spears. Aided by Athena, Odysseus, Telemachus, Eumaeus, and the other faithful herdsmen kill all the suitors, all hundred of them. And Odysseus look around him, narrow-eyed, for any others who might lay hidden while death's black fury passed. In blood and dust he saw that the crowd all fallen, many and many slain. Think of a catch that fishermen haul into the half moon bay and the fine mesh net from the white caps of the sea and how all the fish are poured out on the sand in throws for the salt sea, twitching their cold lives away in Helios' fiery air. So lay the suitors heaped on one another. So they describe um, all the dead bodies in the hall, all kind of being piled on top of each other, this massive heap of hundreds of men just twitching. It's really lovely. Okay, I don't know if that was a fair fight or not. Okay, let's take a look at the study guide, number 11. It says to identify the simile in lines 1370 to 1376. This will most likely be on the final exam, by the way, this exact simile. It's called an epic simile. Okay, so on page 1007 is the simile that we need to look at. We know a simile is a comparison using the words like or as. This is an epic simile because it is um, because it's uh, used in an epic poem. Epic just means ginormously important and gigantic and big in, big in every way. Okay, so 1370. But the man skilled and always contending, satisfied by the great bow's look and heft, like a musician, like a harper, when with quiet hand upon his instrument he draws between his thumb and forefinger a sweet new string upon the peg, so effortlessly Odysseus in one motion strung his bow. Then he slid his right hand down the cord and he plucked it. So the top gut vibrating hummed and sang like a swallow's note. Doing. What is the comparison? What two things are being compared in there? A musician is a harper, so close. But definitely musicians in the mix. What's being compared to a musician? Correct. Odysseus, who's not a musician, is being compared to a musician. But there's more to it, so don't stop there. What does Odysseus have? He has a bow, which is similar to which musical instrument? There you have it. So this is our epic simile. Hold on. So number 11, we are comparing Odysseus and his bow to a musician and a harp. And we're talking about how when a musician plays an instrument, that m instrument basically becomes an extension of that musician. It's kind of like they're one. Well, that's how Odysseus is with his bow. He uses it, but it's an extension of him. It's kind of like um, Katniss in The Hunger Games, how her bow, she, whatever she basically thinks that's killing birds out of the sky. Same idea. So number 12, why is it significant? Well, I think I talked about this, but... Just like an instrument is an extension of a musician, kind of like they're one, so is Odysseus's weapon an extension of himself. It's part of him. Number 13, what does Odysseus mean when he says it's time to cook the Lordship's mutton? Let's kick some ass. <laughs> oh. No! Oh! <laughs> okay, 14. Uh, where do the first three arrows go? A is, the first one goes into the target at the end of the axe handles. The second one goes into Antinous, who's the jerkiest jerk ever. 
And the third one goes into Yuri Makis, who's basically the speaker of the suitors. He's trying to save everyone's butt. Hold on. Okay. Ha okay. Everybody, how many suitors are left at the end? Zero. Good job. <laughs> it's Friday, did you know? Yeah. I'm sort of excited. And my baby boy's coming home on Sunday, and I miss him. He's a baby. Yeah. Let's go. Hunter. <laughs> Penelope's test. Page 1015. We love Hunter to call you. You put me off. <laughs> okay. Now it's time for the love part. Every great story, everything in the world is about. Um, love and war. That's what makes the world go round. So here's the love part. Penelope's test. Aww. Penelope tests Odysseus to prove he's really her husband. Page 1015. Great-hearted Odysseus, home at last, was being bathed now by Euronomy and rubbed with golden oil and clothed again in a fresh tunic and cloak. Athena lent him beauty. <laughs> Head to foot. She made him taller and massive, too, with crisping hair and curls like petals of the wild hyacinth, but all red golden. A think of gold infused on a silver by a craftsman whose fine art Hephaestus taught him, or Athena, uh, one whose work moves to delight. Just so, she lavished beauty over Odysseus' head and shoulders. He sat then in the same chair by the pillar, facing his silent wife, and he said, Strange woman, the immortals of Olympus made you hard, harder than any. Who else in the world would keep aloof as you do from her husband if he returned to her from years of trouble, cast on his own land in his 20th year? Penelope spoke to Odysseus now, and she said, Hmm, strange man, if man you are. This is no pride on my part, nor scorn for you, not even wonder merely. I know so well how you how he appeared boarding the ship for Troy, but all the same. Make up his bed for him, Euryclea. Place it outside the bedchamber my lord built with his own hands. Pile the big bed with fleeces, rugs, and sheets of purest linen. With this, she tried him to the breaking point, and he turned on her in a flash, raging, Woman, by heaven, you've stung me now. Who dared move my bed? No builder had the skill for that unless a god came down to turn the trick. No mortal in his best days could budget with a crowbar. There is our pact and pledge, our secret sign, built into that bed, my handiwork, and no one else's. An old trunk of olive grew like a pillar on this building plot, and I laid out our bedroom around that tree, and I lined up stone walls, built the walls and the roof, and gave it a doorway and smooth-fitting doors. And then I locked off the silvery leaves and the branches, and I hewed and shaped that stump from the roots up into a bedpost, drilled it, and let it serve as a model for the rest. I planed them all, inlaid them with silver, gold, and ivory, and stretched a bed between, a pliant web of oxhide thongs dyed crimson. There's our sign, I know no more. Could someone else's hand have sawn that trunk and dragged the frame away? <gasps> Their secret. As she heard it told, her knees grew, trem knees grew tremulous and weak. Her heart failed her. With eyes brimming tears, she ran to him, throwing her arms around his neck and kissed him, murmuring, Do not rage at me, Odysseus. No one ever matched your caution. Think what difficulty the gods gave. They denied us life together in our prime and flowering years, kept us from crossing into old age together. Forgive me, don't be angry. I, I could not welcome you uh, with love on sight. I armed myself long ago against the frauds of men, impostors who might come, and all those many who underhanded ways bring evil on. <laughs> but here and now, what sign could be so clear as this our own bed? No other man has ever laid eyes on it. Only my own slave, Octorus, that my father sent with me as a gift. She kept our door. You make my stiff heart know that I am yours. Now from his breast into his eyes the ache of longing mounted, and he wept at last. His dear wife, clear and faithful in his arms, longed for as a sun-warmed earth is longed for by a swimmer, spent in rough waters where the ship went down under Poseidon's blows, gales winds and tons of sea. Few men can keep alive through a big surf to crawl. 
clotted with brine, unkindly beaches, and joy, and joy, knowing the abyss behind. And so she too rejoiced, her gaze upon her husband, her white arms around him pressed as though forever. Last thing, Odysseus is re reunited with his father, Laertes, and Athena commands that peace prevail between Odysseus and the relatives of the slain suitors. Odysseus has regained his family and his kingdom. He makes offering to Poseidon, and all ends well. The end. All right. Okay, question number 18. How does Athena change Odysseus' appearance? She makes him hot. He's younger. He's taller. He's stronger. His hair is crispy and curly. I'm not so sure I think that's, I think that's gross. I don't like crispy curly hair. Let's, let's keep the hair soft. Too much mousse, right? Curtis, do you love me or not? Yeah. Oh, but his body, he said, yeah. So uh, that's clearly a lie. I've watched too many of those shows that uh, identify people lying. No. <laughs> okay, number 19. Why does Penelope question whether Odie is a mere man? Because why is he so hot and young? Hello? By the way, just so you know, Athena makes Penelope young again, too. So they actually do get to grow old together. Everybody, number 20. Why can't the bed be moved? Because it's a tree. And it's still got a trunk and roots in the ground. It's literally a tree. Like a big old awesome tree house built around this tree. So yeah, if you're the king of Ithaca, you can do what you want. I'm so obnoxious today. I gotta calm down. I need more coffee. No. No. What you need is a red bull. Are you okay? I love this phone. Number 21. I don't know why I didn't get this one. You guys are so spoiled with technology. Uh, 21. What event causes Penelope to recognize Odie? He tells her about the bed. I think it's the swag shirt I'm wearing. Come on, this, I could, they gave us all these shirts. I could never have afforded a shirt this nice. I don't have anything this nice. My first hour says, you're part of the bowling team now? And I went, ah. It's not a bowling team shirt, but it could be. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I'm really bad at bowling. I, I know that's a surprise to you. I need bumpers. I still, I still can't cut her balls even with bumpers. Oh, that's how bad I am. That's why you get strikes every time, people. Come on. Um, where are we? Oh, did anybody catch that? No. They denied them the difficulty of growing. Right. They didn't get to grow old together. Cousin, they were apart for 20 years. And finally, what do they do when they finally get the big hug? Cry. Sob, cry, perfect. Okay, what I want you to do is, um, I actually want to end the hour in peace. So, your options are as follows. 